promises of God, my Savior. Stand in on the promises. Stand in on the promises. I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises that cannot fail. When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God I shall prevail. Standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises, standing on the promises, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing on the promises, standing on the promises. I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises of Christ the Lord. Down to him eternally, my love strong for us. Overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword, standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises, standing on the promises, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing on the promises, standing on the promises. I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises I cannot fall, listening every moment to the Spirit's call, resting in my Savior as my all in all, standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises, standing on the promises, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing on the promises, standing on the promises. I'm standing on the promises of God. Through the promises in God's word, he has shown us the way to eternal life. Let's continue to celebrate as we sing together about the faith that he's placed in our hearts and our trust with him as we walk with him. By faith we see the hand of God In the light of creation's grand design In the lives of those who prove his faithfulness Who walk by faith and not by sight By faith our fathers roam the earth with the power of his promise in their hearts of a holy city built by God's own hand a place where peace and justice reign we will stand as children of the promise we will fix our eyes on him our souls reward Till the race is finished and the work is done. We'll walk by faith and not by sight. I think the prophets saw the day when the long for Messiah would appear with the power to break the chains of sin and death, and rise triumphant from the grave. By faith the church was called to go, and the power of the Spirit to the lost, to deliver captives and to preach good news. Every corner of the earth. We will stand. We, we will stand as children of the promise. We will fix our eyes on him, our souls reward. Till the race is finished and the work is done. We'll walk by faith and not by sight. Yes, God calls not to walk by our own eyes and our own trust, but to trust him by faith, and he will guide us every step of the way. By faith this mountain shall be moved, 
and the power of the gospel shall prevail. For we know in Christ all things are possible. For all who call upon his name, we will stand as children of the promise. We will fix our eyes on him, our souls. walk by faith and not by sight. It is a journey that we walk with Him and the Spirit guides us and the Word of God guides us every single step of the way. We've sung a lot of truths already this morning and as we have represented those truths in our worship, we recognize they're all based on God's Word. We live in the midst of a generation, in a world, in a nation that has pushed off truth. We, did, we uh, as a nation and as a world, we have said there is no absolute truth. And so the culture around us is always fighting against the truth that we hold in our hearts, the truth that guides us, the truth that saved us, and that we walk by that truth every single day. And so as we live this life in this world as an example of Christ and of His truth, we need it. We need His Word every day. So in our worship, when we look to the Word of God and we open the Word of God, what happens? God speaks. We need Him to speak in His Word so that we know the truth that we hold on to and that we trust that truth. So as we read His Word today, Recognize it's the Spirit of God that shows us that truth through His written Word. And God desires to speak to us if we open our hearts to that truth that we're going to read right now. Let's read it aloud together. For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of His majesty. For He received from God the Father, honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And we heard his voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. And Peter actually goes on and ends that chapter talking about the guidance of the Spirit. That when the Word was written down, the prophetic Word was written down, the Spirit guided those writers with the Word of God. So we can trust that Word, that God gives us understanding by His Spirit, and it's inspired, and it guides us every day single day. We thank God that we were born again to a living hope and that there was a glorious day in which we were saved and we can rejoice in the majesty of our Savior today as we continue to worship. Let's praise Him for that glorious day and remember that He brought us out of darkness into His marvelous light. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met you. Oh, what a glorious day that was! I was breathing but not alive. All my 
failures I try to hide. It was my tomb till I met you. You called my name. and he brought him out of that tomb. Let our thoughts focus on that, the rescue that our God gave us. I needed rescue. My sin was heavy. My chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter. I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. Praise the Lord for that glorious day that we saved. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. God, we thank you. Thank you that you called our name. And when you called our name, we answered. We responded to your call. And your word tells us, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So, Lord, we thank you <laughs> that it was your will, your desire to call us. And, Lord, we responded. And we said, God, save me. And thank you, Lord, that you redeemed us. You brought us out of that pit, and you set our feet on a solid rock, and that is the rock of Christ himself. Thank you, Lord, as we continue to worship you. We look to your word, and we open our hearts to the truth that you have to speak to us. May you guide us through this week by your truth. And God, as we give today, help us to give for your glory and out of obedience, but also, Lord, out of worship, because we can never outgive you. We love you. We praise you for all you've done for us. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Really? 
picked up dust and he threw it forth and he made a man that could walk and an eagle that could fly then he sent forth the lights he said that it be and he made a starry starry night he made the raging sea and one day when i was walking all alone he laid his hand on me he laid his hand on me he wrote the songs that the songbirds sing and he made the earth spin around the sun ain't that the coolest thing he created a fish that could swim upstream and he made some little tiny wings for the big old bumblebee and one day when i was walking all alone he laid his hand on me his hand on me. Well, words cannot tell it. It's better felt than told. The change he made in my life when he reached down for my soul. And when you hear the message from the man himself, you won't have to hear it from anybody else. said to let the thing shine he gave me a bell he said to ring it a song he said to sing it and he's with me all the time he gave me a hope that would see me through all the trouble that i have down here and anything that makes me blue because one day when i was walking all alone he laid his hand on me laid his hand on me. Well, words cannot tell it. It's better felt than told. The change he made in my life when he reached out for my soul. And when you hear the message from the man himself, you won't have to hear it from anybody else. Said to let the thing shine. He gave me a bell. He said to ring it a song. He said to sing it, and he's with me all the time. He gave me a home that would see me through all the trouble that I have down here and anything that makes me blue. Cause one day when I was walking all alone, he laid his hand on me. He laid his hand on me. He laid his hand on me. Yes, he laid his hand on me. Amen. Thank you, Sherwin, for reminding us. And God calls us and He sets us apart, and we belong to Him, and those hands never leave us. Amen. We're always safe and secure when he puts his hand on us. Children are running off to study God's word in children's church this morning, and they have a copy of God's word. I hope you do this morning because we want to hear God speak. And we're in John's gospel this morning, so if you'll turn there, John chapter 1. In a moment, we'll stand and read this section, verses 14 through 18 of John chapter 1. If you don't have a Bible, we always encourage you to grab one there in the pew rack because every heart should be open before the word the word is living it's active it's sharper than a two-edged sword and it wants to speak into your life and my life and what does it do it exposes our hearts it reveals something about us because it reveals something about God and God's light and since he reflects things and makes things known and that light radiates from his presence and out of his word and he'll illumine your life and my life and he may put his hand on something in your life and say this is what I want to work on in your life as I make you more into the image of my son, Jesus. Now, Paul would say over there in Hebrews, not only that the word is living, but when he opened that book of Hebrews, he said that God uh, at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers 
by the prophets. But in these last days, he's spoken to us in this unique word, his son. The word that we'll discover, John would say, was made flesh. When you look in the Old Testament, when you read through that section, maybe you're doing your daily Bible reading and you're reading through there all those different sections of the Old Testament. God spoke in different ways, in different manners, all throughout the Old Testament. Sometimes it was a dream. Sometimes it was a vision. Uh, sometimes it was written on tablets. Sometimes his handwriting was on a wall. God spoke in a variety of ways to the fathers. And when he spoke to them, he had a message that they needed at that time and that ultimately would be pointing to Jesus. But when he spoke in these last days, Paul would tell us, and John would tell us, that word wasn't on tablets, it wasn't on the wall, it wasn't in a vision, it wasn't in a dream, it was in flesh. God spoke to us through Jesus. Jesus is the sermon of God to us. He reveals who God is to us, just as the word would speak to us in the Old Testament. Jesus is God's word to us, the word that was with him, the word that was God. And the same spirit that inspired the Old Testament prophets inspired the New Testament apostles and disciples and Paul to write down what they saw, the message that they heard. And so when you and I are opening John's gospel, God is speaking to us just as he spoke to them. And they're telling us what that word was to them, what that message was to them. And we need that word from God. We need it. Why? Because when you look in the Old Testament and you read through those different messages from God, they're all partial. It's fragmented. It's not the complete picture. It is an S, some element of something complete that would happen later. When Christ comes, he is the complete picture. He's everything. Do you want to know the Father? Look at Jesus. If you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. And so when they're revealing, when they're giving us this eyewitness testimony, they're saying, look at Jesus if you want to know God. And particularly, that's what John's saying in his gospel. In fact, just because that was their Old Testament uh, promises and words from God and prophecies and visions and dreams, just because they were incomplete and just because they were fragmented does not mean they were any less true or worthy of consideration. What's important is when God speaks this final word, this is the word that we have to deal with right here. This is the complete picture right here. The complete package. Everything, listen, is wrapped up in Jesus. That's why no matter what name God may have revealed himself in the Old Testament by Elohim, Yahweh, Jehovah Rophe, Jehovah Nisi, uh, Jehovah Shalom, El Shaddai. All those names were a picture of a essence of God, something about him. But it wasn't the complete picture. But Jesus is the complete picture. That's why he's the name above every name. Because he's all of those names, all that God is, wrapped up right there. And he's God's word to you and me. And I need to hear this word this morning, and you need to hear this word. In fact, when I stand to preach, I'm supposed to take this word right here, this word from God, and this word, the message, should center on the living word of God. It should point to Jesus. And, and because Jesus said these scriptures point to him. And so good preachers don't just give you our opinion. We say, thus saith the Lord. This message speaks with authority. It points to Jesus, and it tells us who he is. And we exegete, we bring out from the text what the text says. We don't eisegete and read something into it. We bring out from the text what it says. And that's what John is saying this morning. In a moment, when we stand and read it, he's going to use that particular word, exegete, that Jesus exegetes the Father. Jesus tells us who the Father is. You and I can't see him. We can't know him because he's so far beyond us. And yet, when God spoke to us and revealed himself completely to us in this way, Jesus is that picture. And he exposes, reveals who God is that we can't see in ourselves. And the danger is so many people want to read into that's who God is, that's who God is, that's who God is. And we don't define God. God defines himself. He tells us who he is. 
And Jesus is that complete expression of him made known to John and the disciples and through their eyewitness made known to us. So stand with me and honor the word of the Lord. We want to read just verses 14 through 18 this morning because God has given us this complete and final word. And John's going to weave these ideas together in an incredible way uh, here in verses 14 through 18. And so what does he say? And the word became flesh. Now remember in verse 1, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God, deity, completely but he took on humanity. He, he became flesh. And he dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory as the on, of the only begotten of the Father. Full of grace and truth. Now John bore witness of him and cried out saying. This was he of whom I said. He who comes after me is preferred before me. For he was before me. And of his fullness we have all received. And grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Now, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, here it is, He has declared Him, exegeted Him, revealed Him to us. What does He reveal? He reveals three things when God speaks to us His sermon in Jesus today that we want to discover. It's glorious, and let's pray. God, speak to us today, just as your glorious presence. Lord, that Shekinah glory there in heaven. Lord, at times, your presence was seen on earth, Lord, and it brought a word from you. Now, Jesus is that word from you, and Lord, may we hear him speak today, and may your spirit, the spirit of truth, speak to us today, and reveal in our hearts, Lord, that we not only have heard the message of Jesus, but we have received it and placed our faith and trust in Him. And that, Lord, our, day, our lives are being changed day by day as we're sanctified in the truth of Jesus. We love you and we praise you. And we ask this all in His glorious name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. What is the message that God wants us to hear today? What is the message that... I need him to speak into my life and you need to speak into your life as well. When God spoke in the flesh, listen, God, no man has seen God at any time. He dwells in in unapproachable light. He's incomprehensible. He's infinite. You and I cannot fully understand him. My peanut brain right here, listen. In order for me to understand something about him, he had to make himself known to you and to me. And he did that. The infinite put on finite temporarily. The invisible became tangible. You could see him. The transcendent God so high, exalted, above all things, became imminent. He stepped into space and time that he created. The word that was with God and was God took on flesh. This doesn't mean that he filled a human body merely and that human became God. No, Jesus in his deity added humanity to his deity. And two of those natures, the humanity and the deity, all were one person, Jesus Christ, the Lord. And John says, this is his testimony of the incarnation right here. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. You don't have the wonderful passages like you do in Matthew and Luke that give the birth account of Jesus. John just says, hey, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And he exegeted the Father. He declared who the Father is and what he is like. Now, what did he say about him? What was this message? Well, it says right here that when when he came, it was a glorious message. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Watch this now. And we beheld his glory, the glory of as of the only begotten of the Father. Now listen, God is a glorious being, amen? He dwells in unapproachable light. It's His Shekinah glory. Listen, that glory, His presence, will radiate all of heaven, and there'll be no need for a sun, no need for a light source. It will just be the beauty of... That glorious presence of the Lord. 
that fills all of heaven, that glorious presence was present in Jesus when he spoke. And he came, and just as he speaks, anytime God speaks, it is glorious. Creation, Psalm 19 says, the heavens declare what? The glory of the Lord. All of creation is speaking, and that glorious message to you and to me, that glorious message is there is an awesome God who made all things, and he has incredible wisdom and power. And he speaks through that creation. But that message is incomplete. It doesn't tell us his name. It just tells us that there is a God. In fact, when God spoke to Moses and gave him the law there on Mount Sinai, he descended in that cloud, that, that, that cloud that kind of veiled his glorious presence. Moses went up on the mountain, and there on the mountain, he said, God, show me your glory. And God said, you can't see my glory, but I'm going to hide you in the cleft of the rock, and I'm going to pass by, and you can see me. You can't see me face to face, Moses. You can't see me in this way, but I'll let you see thee as I pass by. His glorious presence, that Shekinah glory. In fact, as he led his people through the wilderness, that Shekinah glory, a pillar of fire by night, a pillar of cloud by day, that led them, that pillar of fire, that Shekinah glory would fill the tabernacle or fill the temple. And, and, and you would know when you came up to this, this structure that there was a glorious presence of the Lord. John says in the same way when Jesus became man, when the word took on flesh, it was a glorious message from God. The glorious arrival of God. You remember what the angels declared over in Luke? They said, listen, there's glory that's been brought here to this earth in Bethlehem. You need to go and see. This glorious God comes. This is the God who took on flesh and dwelt among us. Now, what's the picture there? The picture is this. He tabernacled or pitched his tent with us. Just like in the Old Testament, God pitched his tent in the wilderness with his people. When they left Egypt and God gave Moses the instructions there to construct and build the tabernacle, it was a temporary structure in the, Old Test, in, in the wilderness where God's people met with him for worship. They sacrificed to him there. But it was a temporary structure. It was only used until they got through the wilderness, until the temple would be made. It was humble in its appearance. It was unattractive. It was just boards and skins on the outside. There was nothing that you would say, wow, that's awesome. What was awesome was what was on the inside. What was awesome was that Shekinah glory pillar that would fill it as it moved from place to place. It would leave the tabernacle and, and, and lead and guide direct God's people through the wilderness and then stop and the tabernacle will be erected and it would be filled once again into the Holy of Holies. That's what was awesome about it. It's as everybody would come and say, there's nothing much about this structure, but wow, that presence right there. Who is that? That's God. He's with us, leading and guiding us. Now, when Solomon built the temple... There's a striking contrast. It's not a temporary structure. It was a permanent structure. It's in the city where God said he would place his name. And there, again, a place of worship, a place of sacrifice, a place for meeting with man, sinful man, to come to God. And yet there, that structure built for a king in all its glory, in all its presence, again, the Shekinah glory of God filled that place where God would speak to man and say, you're a sinner in need of a savior, and I'm the only one that can save you from your sins. Now, those two pictures are different and distinct and in quite contrast to one another. A temporary structure, a permanent structure. Nothing attractive, nothing that draws your attention. A humble structure, just boards and pillars and, and curtains. No, a glorious gold, uh, a gold-wrapped building, right? Something that People from all over the world came to see the temple. You see, those two structures, though, that had God's glorious presence are pictures of who Christ is in his coming. In his first appearing, there was nothing that would attract us to him. Isaiah 53, the suffering servant who comes, there's nothing about him that would say, oh, yes, come to me, come to me, come to me, I'm God. There was nothing about him. And yet he came in that humble way, in that temporary structure called the flesh. Listen, 
for 33 years to walk upon this earth so that he could be the one who offers the sacrifice so that men could truly worship the one true God. Now, when he comes the second time, it will not be in a humble appearance, will it? No, he's coming as king. He's coming to reign and rule on this earth. And he will reign and he will rule for a thousand years. And what John is saying is when God sent his son Jesus to us, that message from him was glorious. The glorious, the full glory of God. Paul would say it this way in Colossians chapter 2 verse 9. That in him the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily. The glorious presence of God was veiled in that flesh temporarily. Jesus who was in the form of God, fully God, Paul would say in Philippians chapter 2, did not regard that as something to hold on to, but he emptied himself and took on flesh and became a man. And he took on the form not only of man, but of a servant. Now when John and Peter, the passage we read earlier, as we were reading scripture, highlighted this, they were able to see the, the veil pulled back a little bit on the Mount of Transfiguration. That they beheld his glory. They, they beheld his majesty. That they beheld him for a moment. And they heard the voice from heaven who said, This is my son in whom I am well pleased. This is God's message of glory to us. His glorious message. John says, listen, this one who was the word that was with God and was God took on flesh. And John the Baptist said, listen, he bore witness and said, This was he of whom I said, he who comes after me is to be preferred before me, for he was before me. Now, if you know anything from Luke's gospel, you know this. John the Baptist was born before Jesus was born of Mary. But John says, listen, he was before me. He, he was before me because, you see, he is the Son of God. He is God. He is eternal, and I'm not. And John affirms this. And so what God has given to us, the very essence of who he is, has been revealed to us in a glorious way. The one who is in the bosom of the Father, he has been made known to us. And so in Jesus, when you look to him, he is the wisdom of God, the grace of God, the righteousness of God, the mercy of God, the power of God, the glory of God, the sovereignty of God. He is everything that the Father is. And so when somebody says, I wish I knew God, I wish I could know what God is like, look at Jesus. He reveals what God is like and who God is. And that's why later in John's gospel, what Jesus would say, listen, listen, you search the scriptures and these things what? Point to me. Now, notice here in verse 14, this glorious message begotten of the, of the only begotten of the Father, watch this now, it is full of grace and truth. Now, this is important. I've drawn a line from there in verse 14 down to verse 17. The law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. This glorious message that God speaks is a gracious message, and it's a truthful message. And it's those two things that we desperately need. And what John would say, you need to know these things, and you need to believe in them. First, his grace. How is it a gracious message? message. We'll look in verses 16 and 17. Of his fullness, that glorious fullness that we have all received, we have received what? Grace for grace or grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Now this is an unusual statement. What is this grace upon grace or this grace for grace? What is it that we need? Well, it is a gracious message. Something that we receive, we don't deserve. God brings it to us graciously and praise the Lord. He does that because we weren't seeking after him. We had no desire for him, but he comes to sinful man and he speaks. And that message that he speaks is gracious in and of itself that he offers himself to you and to me. That grace comes to us and we experience that amazing grace when we repent of our sins and put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And when you and I choose to do that, what happens is we have been graced by God. And then what happens as you walk through life, trusting in him, resting in him, your faith secure in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, is God just graces you every day. 
God just graces you over and over and over and over and over. In fact, Paul would say it this way over in Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 15. That the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared. That grace of God that came to us, that message of God that came to us, that gracious word is not just a word about Jesus, it is Jesus, and he is the grace of God to you and me. He is God's gift to us this morning. Praise the Lord, we've experienced God's amazing grace. Listen, that grace, Paul would say over in Romans chapter 6, it's greater than all our sin, amen? Praise the Lord, there's sufficient grace for not just me, but for you and for this whole world. That our sins, though they, listen, so though we're blotted and we're, we're stained by them, we can be made clean by the grace of Almighty God. I don't have to carry on the guilt of my sin through life. I can be free. In fact, that grace is what sustains us as we go through life. It's what gives us victory through the trials that we face. Paul himself saying over in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, when there was a thorn in his flesh, God spoke to him and said, listen, my grace is sufficient for you. Some of us need to ask for that grace today as you've navigated this week and you realize, Lord, I've been walking through it. It's been difficult. Cry out to him and say, God, I just want to experience that grace that I need. You see, I pray for those graces frequently. They come in a, a variety of ways. There's healing grace and strengthening grace. There's sanctifying grace. There's, of course, redemptive grace. I mean, God just graces us anytime. Man, he's just good. Amen. And he just spills that into your life. Are you praising him for it? Are you thanking him for it? Man, I'm glad I heard that message of amazing grace in Jesus. And every day, this isn't just something I gather on Sunday morning for an hour and I go, oh, amen, praise the Lord. No, 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 every day, grace upon grace is just coming over and over, just like wave after wave. You know, it's just like you're sitting on the seashore. And you know you can just sit there as the high tide's coming in. And you just hit by wave after wave after wave of the ocean. It's just like that with his grace. He just brings it. He just brings wave after wave. And it just abounds. It's that grace, Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 15, 10. It's by this grace I am what I am. Now, what's amazing is this. For the law was given through Moses. The law didn't bring grace. The law didn't bring grace. What the law revealed is we need grace. The law revealed I need mercy. Moses brought the law and the law said we're sinners. We're undone. We got no hope. But, but Jesus brought us grace. Jesus brought us what we couldn't achieve. Jesus brought us redemption. And so all of this comes. God can be gracious to you and to me. Listen. Because Jesus has met the requirements of the law. He fulfilled the law. He did everything the law commanded. And if he hadn't have done that, there would not be a righteous, righteous sacrifice to offer to God in our place. But because he did fulfill the law, and he did complete everything that was written there, every letter of it, he can go and offer a sacrifice for you and for me. And there on that cross, pay the penalty as a perfect sacrifice for my sin. And then an exchange can take place when I repent of my sin and say, God, have mercy on me. I'm undone. The law exposes me. Uh, the tutor has brought me to Christ, and I realize I need Jesus. And I can cry out, God, have mercy on me because of what Jesus has done on that cross. And an exchange can take place where I give him my unrighteousness because the penalty's been paid there, and he gives me the righteousness I can never achieve. Woo! Praise the Lord. Grace comes through Jesus. And now a gracious exchange can be made. We are then saved by grace through faith. Do you believe that today? Has there been a time in your life where you've said, I'm a sinner. I cannot save myself. Jesus, I believe you accomplished what I never could, perfection. And I want to put my faith and my trust in you. You substituted yourself for me. You took the penalty that I deserve. My trust rests in you. Save me from my sins. Because when that happens, when I believe in that, when I profess my faith in Jesus Christ, you experience God's amazing grace and you avail yourself every single day for God to just give you wave after wave after wave of grace. Grace upon grace. What a gracious message this morning. Listen, that grace is reaching to us today with a nail-pierced hand. And God is saying, it's for all, any and all, 
whosoever will call on the name of the Lord, you can be saved. This grace is message. Now let me show you something. You know what's amazing? John mentions that right here. And throughout the rest of his gospel, he'll never mention grace again. Huh? What? No, he won't. But he will mention the other element of it. Fifty-five times he'll mention it. And what is that? Let's see, this glorious message of God is not just a gracious message. It's a true message. It's a true message that you must believe. You see, he'll say that over and over again. This grace and truth that came from the only begotten of the Father, when God spoke in this way, this grace and this truth that has come to us, that didn't come through Moses, but came complete through Jesus Christ, this truthful message that we need to believe, it had to be this way. Why? Look at verses 17 and 18. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. You see, no one has seen the essence of God. They've seen the glorious presence of God, but they've not seen the light. Can't. Paul would tell Timothy, no one can see God. No one has seen Him and no one can see Him. No, no man can see that infinite, awesome presence of God. He's so beyond us. And yet what he does reveal about himself is enough to say, I want him. And when God reveals himself in this way and reveals something about himself, in the Old Testament it was visions and dreams, and God manifested himself in Christophanies and Theophanies at times, but those weren't the complete picture of God. No one has seen God as he truly is. Even Isaiah, when he said, listen, I'm undone, I've seen the king, he, God's glorious presence was there and Isaiah saw enough to know I'm undone and praise God he made a sacrifice or made a provision for him there with one of the coals to take away his iniquity God dwells in approachable light so the question then is this how would we know that we've seen God that we've had a message from him how, how would we know what truth is it that we have to believe well it would be if there was one who was in the bosom that one was with the Father, complete with Him, as John 1 says, right? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The 1, verse 18, the only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, He has explained Him. Unless God came right from, ready, right from the heart of God. Unless that message came to us, it would not be the complete, true picture that we would know. It may be fragmented, it might be partial, it might be still worthy to believe, but here's the complete picture right here in Jesus. And it is the truthful word to us. And John is going to emphasize that over and over and over again. Now think about that, because his purpose is what? I'm writing these things so that you might believe. And I don't know about you, but I want to believe what's true. Because the God of this world, listen, he tries to blind the eyes of mankind from the truth. In fact, Paul would even say that over in 2 Corinthians, that the God of this world blinds men, listen, so they don't see the glorious presence of Jesus. They don't see the glory of God. He doesn't want them to see that. And so the very God of very God, Jesus in the bosom of God, straight from the heart of God, he speaks to us. And he exegetes, he brings out what's inside the Father. He brings out and speaks to us everything about the Father and why we should believe in him. We don't read anything into God, it comes out from him and he tells us who he is. And that is what Jesus did as the word from God. And now John over and over is going to highlight this. He's going to say, Jesus is going to say this over in John chapter 8 verse 32. You shall know the truth and the truth does what? shall set you free. In fact, he'll say in verse 40, you now seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. Verse 44 of chapter 8, you were of your father the devil, and the desires of the father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaks, he's a liar. He speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. But 
Because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Verse 46, which of you convicts me of sin? If I tell you the truth, why do you not believe me? Jesus would say to the apostles over in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Later in verse 17, the spirit of truth which the world cannot receive, that spirit, because it neither sees him or knows him, you know him. Why? Because he dwells in you and will be in you. John 15, 26, but when the helper comes, whom I send to you, the Father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. You see, Jesus came, as he told Pilate, I came to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. You see, Jesus is the truth. He's the truthful message from God. He is worth believing in. Now listen, we live in a day and age where no one believes there's absolute truth. And they're absolutely certain of it, which is the, right, the irony of it all, right? It's contradictory what they say. God has spoken a glorious word, a gracious word to us, and a truthful word. And it is incumbent upon us who now have heard that message to make a decision. Either I believe the truth or I reject the truth. And that's the only two options. What is my response to this message? Do I believe what I hear God say or do I reject it? And our response to that message has significant implications, not only for my daily life, but for our eternity. What is beyond this life? And now see, listen, we are all souls that have bodies. Those bodies are temporary. Just as Jesus took on a body that was temporary. It was for this earth. Yes, we'll get glorious bodies and those will last forever and ever. But these, these right here, these tents, they're, they're, listen, they're coming down someday. They don't last. We'll get glorious ones one day. But here's the thing. Unless you and I receive this gracious message from God and put our faith and trust in the truth of what God has said to us, we won't experience those glorious bodies in the presence of God forever and ever. We'll be separated from him and worms will destroy our bodies forever and ever. What an irony. You see, I ask you this morning a simple question. How have you responded to God's message preached to you in Jesus? Jesus said, listen, anyone who comes to the Father, you got to come through me. He is the only way. And if I realize that this morning, there needs to be a time in my life where I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, I've placed my faith and trust in Jesus. Because God wants you to believe the truth of what he says. And he wants us to experience the grace that comes through Christ. In fact, if you're struggling with sin, the answer for your sin, the answer for my sin is the same, the grace of God. That's the only answer. You will struggle with it and struggle with it and struggle with it, but that grace is greater than your sin. That grace can set you free from that sin. And as we sang, God's glorious presence can break the shackles of sin in your life. But you have to come to him. And when you do, then you sit on that seashore and those waves of grace begin to come into your life. And you realize, man, I've been graced. God, you've been so good. I've been graced. You've been so good. I've been graced. You've been so good. And you just become a channel for his grace to not only affect you and pour into your life, but then to pour through you and out of your life into the lives of those around you. And you see how God graces you. And it's not just for yourself. There's so much available to all. But it's only for those that surrender to Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And to do that, you have to relinquish control. You have to surrender and give it all to him. And so the question this morning is, have you done that? Or are you willing to do that this morning? Are you living in defeat? The God of this world has blinded you. Jesus promises, listen, there's sufficient grace this morning if you'll turn to him and trust in him. Maybe we just need to get on the altar. There's some thorn in our flesh that we've been carrying. And God says, listen, my grace is sufficient. Give it over to me and trust in me. That's why we open up the altar for a time of decision where people take steps of faith 
steps of obedience as God's word has spoken to him. And as we do that this morning, we are graced. And God has plenty to spill into your life today. If you want to receive it, I'm going to invite you to come now and receive that grace by trusting in the Lord. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. God is reaching to us this morning with a gracious offer, an offer you cannot refuse. Our pastors are here at the front. The pianist is going to be beginning to play. We're not standing and singing, but oh, we're looking in our hearts and we're asking ourselves this question. Have I been graced by Almighty God because I've believed the truth of his message? If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then we invite you to do that this morning, to come and ask God for forgiveness for your sins, to acknowledge to him he's God and you're not, to acknowledge the truth of the gospel, that Jesus is the only way of salvation, and to say, God, save me from my sins. Perhaps you need to come today. You've done that. You're attached to Jesus. He's the head of your life. He is your Savior, but you need to be attached to a local body of believers. And God has led you here to South River Baptist Church. And today you need to say, you know what, I need to plant my life here as one who's been graced by God. And then I need to be part of this body of believers that takes God's grace and shares it with the world around us. The message of grace and the message of truth. If you just need prayer this morning, we're here to pray with you, to encourage you as we walk through this valley and we walk upwards to the city of God to worship him and there we'll behold that Shekinah glory and oh what a sight it will be if you're not carrying the hope of heaven in your heart this morning please come and let us talk with you counsel with you so you can know that you have a personal relationship with the almighty God who made you